It's my distinct pleasure to introduce Rob Rubin to you. He's uh, from Microsoft Corporation, and he is going to present work that he co-envisioned and started with Michael Ritchie from the Boeing Company. Um, this um, Distinctive Voices um, lecture is connected to a Sackler Colloquium we just uh, completed uh, today, which went on over the last two days. And so, please, um, Rob, it's all yours now. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for turning off your cell phone. I appreciate that. Um, uh, so uh, the topic of my talk today, of our talk, is what can the development of the flu vaccine teach us about online learning? And this might seem a little disconnected to you because these are two very, very different disciplines. But I think that uh, uh, I think that we'll see that there is really a deep and intimate connection in how science converges and how then science diverges. And so let me begin with a little story. Right now, um, can you think of two of the most important vaccines? in the history of both this institution and of America. The, the Salk vaccine, that is correct. But we recognize President Lincoln in this picture. For those of you that don't know, one of the things that President Lincoln did was he inoculated this nation. And how did he do that? He created the land-grant schools. And what are those land-grant schools? States were allowed to set aside land for the purpose of the study of science. And in fact, President Lincoln was the president who started the National Academy of Science and also sent, put that into law. Now, why do I call the Morrill Act the land, also commonly known as the Land Grant Act, an inoculation. Because if you have a college education, then you are inoculated in one way. That is that your earnings are considerably more than if you don't have a college education. And for one very large phase of the Industrial Revolution, that was enough for you to work and that was enough for you to retire very comfortably. So it was one, not only was this moral act responsible for the democratization of, shall we say, education and meritocracy, but it was also a very important form of innovation and public service. Okay. <clears throat> so, Let's talk a little bit about what's a response from the scientific community to some of the known crises. So let's talk first about health and infectious disease. And then second, let's talk about why the fourth industrial revolution and the role education has to play in that is also a looming crisis. As Kati introduced me, this is a diagram that I've borrowed from one of her talks. But this is a pretty important diagram. Look at how the next pandemic influenza is traced. Look at what can happen. So if we look early on and we see early on the 14th century, which is right up here on the left, I think if I point here. Uh, is that it? Right here. Not a very, very, I mean, quite, quite significant in the annals of history. But by comparison, because of the air travel and the ability to move, we really do see 
that in the 21st century, the SARS map is quite, quite expansive. And in fact, we can see seasonal and geographical forecasts. And we can also see some experiments here in terms of the reproductive model, that is that what happens if there are, what happens if this distribution spreads the way it might. And this is not just um, indicative of what the crisis might look like, but it's also predictive in the sense that interventions are possible. And so what makes this possible? What makes the influenza vaccine so critical from a science point of view, you could imagine, is this is a national health crisis if people are infected by that virus. And so particularly the el elderly, the sick, et cetera. And scientists have to do all this prediction. Now notice this is something I haven't talked about yet. I haven't talked about biology at all here. This is predictive. This is a deep data exercise. So that is a crisis. What's the next crisis? Or what is the next big challenge facing our country right now and facing the world? Well, particularly if you work for Boeing or if you work for Microsoft, you need a STEM education. And there's a huge skilling challenge in manufacturing, in data science, and technology skills. What's happened here is we see that this, in the late 18th century, in the Industrial Revolution, relatively stable production plants enabled by water and steam. Early 20th century, we're able to get to automation and scale. Starting in the post-World War II revolution, when Peter Denming went to Japan, introduced quality control and lean manufacturing, there was all about how plant operations worked. Today, we're in the digital manufacturing era. And so what's happened across each era is new jobs have been created through innovation, but others became obsolete. What is it about the fourth industrial revolution that is going to be different? Well, the predictions are that it's going to fundamentally alter the way we live, work, and relate to one another. And the prediction is that this transformation is going to be rather dramatic. We have to have a response to this. It's got to be comp comprehensive. It's got to involve all of the stakeholders. And it's got to include academia and the public and private sectors. And this is the crisis that we're facing. Now, I've been talking for a bit. I'm going to slow down here, and I'm going to ask the audience two questions. So question number one, just shout it out. Can you name five scientific and technological innovations in the last three decades in medical science that have transformed lives? Go ahead. Pardon? I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. Organ transplant. MRIs, fMRIs. What else? Total joints. Joints. Joint replacements. What else? Statin drugs. Statins. What else? Genome. Genome. Cracking the human genome. Eric Landers. That's right. Pretty easy for you to do it. Now, I'm just going to ask for five, but I'd appreciate one or two. Can you name those innovations in learning science? in the last century. What has changed about learning? Computers, computer-based learning. MOOCs. We're struggling here, aren't we? We're struggling. We are not yet a discipline. In other words, what makes medical science a discipline? What makes it a discipline is 
that things have converged. These, these disciplines, these independent disciplines, have all merged to become one. And then, according to the theory of convergence, they will diverge again. But to answer this, anybody here uh, from the Annals of Psychology know about the marshmallow test? So, good, so, the, so you don't think about that as part of learning science, but what's the marshmallow test? Basically, uh, this test was conducted at Stanford, and uh, a kindergartner comes in and is asked uh, if they would complete a little task. And they're told, you know, if you do this task, we'll give you a marshmallow, but if you delay, we'll give you a couple more marshmallows. And Let's see what happens to that learner, to that small child. Turns out that the learners, the students, these children that delay gratification are very predictive. That behavior is very predictive of several other indicators. Turns out it's predictive of success in graduating high school, of SAT scores, of even your body mass index. <laughs> Very predictive. So Bloom, Two Sigma, Bloom. So notice how these are all very separate. Two Sigma, Bloom showed how interventions in the classroom can result in a Two Sigma improvement in the classroom. We now know about brain science, the amygdala, attention, neuroimaging. We know how the amygdala shrinks Instead of the flight or fight reaction, that reactivity slows and you're able to focus. If you've heard of adaptive learning, item response theory is a form of mathematics that allows you to really think hard, uh, to really know what somebody has done and what the next question should be. All of the college boards today, for example, or the GMATs, uh, employ some form of adaptivity where if you, can't, if you don't know what a quadratic equation is, they're not going to keep asking you for more quadratic equations. It's going to go back and ask you some algebra questions to see about your mastery there. And of course, we will talk about MOOCs, SPOCs, and blended learning, which are very recent, uh, 2011, in fact. And so we'll bring you up to date. Okay, so what is the difference here, and I'm going to come back to this if we look at it, between the discipline of vaccine development, the discipline that's brought to bear on all this medical science and biology. It is the convergence. Not only is this creation of a vaccine a biological process, not only is it about what are the eight gene segments that you might see up here in the gene. All of this leading to how you grow the cells, what the new flu strain might be, and then leading to a vaccine. But if you're really gonna solve this problem, you need a manufacturing cycle. And you know what that manufacturing cycle includes? It includes production, it includes logistics, and you know, all of this is what goes into what we call this entire body of medical science. And not only is it just mathematics, not only is it logistics, but it's all across the spectrum here. And there, is, there are governing bodies that will enable the creation of that vaccine. But this was all made possible by complexity theory, by biology theory, by experimentation, by understanding the fundamentals of the biology of the flu itself and of the human reaction to that. What we're talking about here is a call for a similar convergence. If we look at how much has the industrial revolution produced in terms of information, it's been linear mechanistic. The information age lasted roughly 
40 years here, preceded, I think, by Anna Verbosch, who wrote in The Atlantic, I don't know if you've all seen this article, As We May Think, Anna Verbosch in the post-World War II era wrote an article in the 40s predicting Google, predicting hypertext, producing, predicting tax, taxonomy and classification. He set out the agenda for this country that has contained us for this information age. But right now, we see vast amounts of data, vast amounts of data. And we're going to see today, I'm going to show you some experiments that are happening right now, what happens when you instrument the classroom, what happens when you instrument an entire school district, how much information is captured. And the real, real question right now is how will we be able to keep up in this post-information age? So let me begin with a little case study. We call this at Microsoft the Fresno Personalized Learning Initiative. Um, in Fresno, our personalized learning initiative is focused on giving students greater voice. It is on choice and collaboration opportunities in their learning. This initiative was started this fall and included teachers and students from almost every school in the district. Fresno is a large urban district with high poverty rates and provides its students with opportunities to develop the competencies they will need to thrive. That is the goal of the Fresno Personalized Learning Initiative in which Microsoft was able to participate. Now, the Fresno system has very explicit learning outcome goals. And you'll see that they are not just academic ones, but rather they include what is often referred to as 21st century skills or soft skills. I rather prefer power skills. But they refer to them as the future competencies that are acquired by today's employers. Skill communication, strong academic foundation, creativity, all a part of this. So, the elements of the personalized learning initiative includes professional learning, it includes a pedagogical model that centers on student voice, choice, and collaboration. So, the teachers, they take part in this learning through both formal sessions and ongoing communities in their schools. Every PLI classroom, everyone has a device. Everyone, every student has a device and every teacher is trained in how to use all those devices. So what does that result in? It results in a massive array of data integrated for analytics. Um, what, is a, what is really unique about this partnership is that it's bringing together a comprehensive set of data from Fresno. You can imagine how large that is. Student demographics, school climate data, socio-emotional learning measures. Microsoft is integrating all of that into a single model that includes very granular data on the social interactions, how the teachers and students are using the technology in the classroom every day. Imagine, looked exactly like our classroom, doesn't it? 
So the first question you might think is, do we want to talk about the students? That's actually the second question. I'm going to provide a teaser right now. That is, is this personalized learning initiative changing what the teaching practices are in that classroom? The teacher is the ultimate partner. The teachers are not being displaced here by technology. The teachers are those who are the partners to the technology, but they are the enablers of that classroom. So, several things that have happened here, okay? Uh, the teachers, the focus of this initiative is on teachers collaborating, and they're using the same technologies they use with their students. They frequently share stories about how the personalized learning initiative impacts their students. And you can see there's an investment in professional development hours that's required to do this. So let's talk about this. Um, we are PLI teachers in a team able to collaborate with other PLI teachers. So we are not just collaborating our site, we're also collaborating across the district now. So how many teachers are able to collaborate? We're enabling that collaboration. That for us is a very significant, significant advance. The teacher is not isolated. The teacher now becomes part of a community of practice and they're able to collaborate significantly more if they're involved in this initiative than if others are. So that is the first story. The learning advances are rather significant as well. Chapter one, case one. How many here know what a MOOC is? Has anybody, how many people have taken a MOOC in this room, an online learning? How many people have not? Okay. So MOOCs are, um, First and foremost, you can think of them as online classrooms. We will go through what the anatomy of a MOOC is. A Spock, invented by Armando Fox from Berkeley, is this name. What's a Spock? A Spock is a small, personal, small private online course. It's essentially a MOOC used in the classroom. And who here knows what a blended classroom is? A blended classroom is happening and the adoption is very, very fast, but that blended classroom is where a teacher enables the students to do the work online, and then they come back to the classroom. We're gonna attempt a blended classroom exercise here in a couple of minutes. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about the anatomy of a MOOC. Here is a MOOC called 7.00X, this is course seven at MIT. It's the introduction to biology, the secret of life. And Professor Eric Landers, who is the lead in having cracked the human genome and made many, many other great contributions to science, spent his time to build out this course and build a course team that would help him, not just with the lectures, but would also build out many of the challenges and simulations in that course. So the first thing is, you can see here, and I'm not gonna play the video right now, I wish I had recorded it so you could have it, but students are able to watch a video of Professor Landers <laughs> at the board, okay? This is all enabled by edX. MIT, Harvard, Berkeley came together and they funded a nonprofit so that these courses could be distributed across the world, okay? You can imagine that this is in over 100 countries is available, these videos. Um, Microsoft itself has used MOOCs. We have over a million students that have taken Microsoft MOOCs uh, on this. 
And so a professor can now reach many, many more students. And here's the first part, okay? So it starts with Professor Landers saying, we're gonna do our second lecture in genetics. You can see that there's a transcript right here. He's very, very charismatic. Um, and he's talking about Mendel's ideas. Everybody here remember who Mendel is? Ah, great, okay, we're gonna check that. Um, so you might think, okay, here's a video. Something very important then happens. At various sections in the video, you get to test yourself. And so here's an example where you are asked to do a diagram of the cell and then challenged if you've added the chromosomes and the alleles. This is all automatic and you can pretty much test yourself often to make sure that you've comprehended the video and you can move forward. So that's a big part is assessment. Now assessment, multiple choice questions are not what you think of as multiple choice questions because if we go back for a second, we'll see even, and I haven't put up multiple choice, multiple choice today involves hinting, it involves, it involves um, messaging, it involves multiple tries, it is not just choose one of the four options. Another very important part of working online are these interactive simulations. And so here we have an interactive simulation of how, um, how recombination actually might work and what's going to happen when you have or crossing organisms. And you can see from the very top that there are practice problems and then there are graded problems. And this simulator actually helps the student understand the material. And so you can interact with these simulators very much. And then you have two kinds of assessments here. You have assessments where you get multiple attempts. Here you can drag and drop, and you can answer those questions as well. So here you have very different kinds of questions, all supported by the edX platform, where you get to play with the answers and get those responses. So the student, the learner, gets immediate feedback. There's no longer the cycle where you submit your homework and you get it back two weeks later. The professor knows what's going on in the classroom. And so that is for the online students. We are seeing roughly, very often, a 2 to 5% completion rate in those students. Today, MIT offers MicroMasters, so a series of courses that might come together to offer you a degree. Microsoft offers professional programs online. You can take a, se a whole series of courses and your classroom, then, and then you, as an individual, get to say you're qualified for a position in data science. These courses have been transformed into entire programs. And the results, when they're transformed into a program or when they're a professional program, are astounding. In other words, the students that can qualify for a Microsoft professional degree now, or a professional program rather, complete these at a rate of 15 to 30 percent, 15 over 10 of 14 courses, so it's very, very impressive. So that is the first enabling technology distribution around the world. Millions and millions of students are taking it. But this section here, we're now focused on one thing. We're focused on a freshman biology course. Now, Brian White, who is a colleague, um, has said, you know what, he's able to run a small personal online class just for his own class, okay? So he's taken this biology of life, 
he's sectioned it off, and he requires what? He requires that students do the work at home. So what happened? What happens when you do that and when you flip the classroom? So between 2012 and 2013, the first thing is his lectures used to be three hours. That was transformed into content that was done online. Lab time went and stayed in the classroom. So you notice here that the content, okay, from this over here, reduced in the classroom, but rather this was work that was done pre-class. And the assumption was that it was gonna be done pre-class. -pre After that, the wet labs didn't have as much time. You wanna be a biologist, you wanna sit, do that work. He's able to increase the time that students were spending in those labs. Um, so pretty dramatic set of changes here. Very dramatic. And the students had to try the problems. So his assumption was always that after the first try, they can click show answer. What were the goals? His goals were he wasn't concerned that they might not get it from the online materials. For him, it was a wrong answer was a learning opportunity. It wasn't about failure. And so that was what would happen. He'd be able to see what the students understood and what they didn't understand. Very important. So I'm going to say that this was a success. I don't know if you want to cluster. Can we have the handouts? Is that possible? OK. I'm going to ask you to stay. Now, you could imagine Brian, Professor White, standing in front of a classroom like this. I actually sat in his classroom the week before Thanksgiving. You know what generally happens in a classroom before Thanksgiving? Nobody's there. He had over 200 students in an auditorium like this. So I'm going to ask you to cluster into groups of three. I'll need one copy of this right now, if I can. Do we have enough? Just so please get up. Uh, please go around. Uh, sorry, I don't have a copy of this. OK. And you'll all need a quarter for this exercise. We're going to spend about five minutes on this exercise right now. OK. So why did I choose this? Why did I choose this? You guys are looking at me, right? Oh, you thought that this wasn't going to be. All right, here you go. We need it. Take a pencil and a quarter, and if you drop quarters on the floor, it'll be OK. Uh, I'll make some money on this lecture. It'll be good. Um, all right. So we know how. Let me tell you about this, OK? And this is information explosion right here. Um, you are all going to hear a lot about genome. You're going to read the popular press. You're going to try and understand that press. And it's going to have, say, terrible things when you get your genome mapped, right? Uh, it used to cost about a billion dollars to map the genome. Now each of you can get that map for about under $1,000. And you all claimed you remembered how Mendel's theories on genetics worked, OK? I don't even think he had the word. Mendel didn't have the word gene, OK? And so let's say here, so this is very important, OK? You have a recessive genetic disease. Everybody here knows what that means? If it's recessive, that means you might be normal. You're showing no symptoms, right? But remember, you could have a dominant gene and a recessive gene. So let's just say if the father is DD, there's a half chance that we, he will give what? The little d to his offspring. But the same is true for the mother, OK? So let me ask you, if the child gets a d from both mom and dad, the little d, then 
unfortunately, that child will have the disease. So let me ask you a question here, just by a show of hands. I'm not going to ask you to click in. If my first, if I have, if this D, D, if this, these big D, little D, mom and dad, have an offspring, if the first offspring has the disease, does that, and so the probability is one in four, let me ask you this simple statistic question. What's the probability that the next three children will have the disease? How many people think that if the first child has that disease, then for sure the other three children will not have that disease? So there are people here who think that, right? Okay, how many people think that there's unlikely to be any more disease in that family? And what is the probability of doing that? So take, two, take three minutes now and take out your quarters and let's see the genotype. What if you get it? How would you get the phenotype here? Okay. Flip a coin. If it's heads, you get a big D. If it tails, the allele is little d, okay? and write that in the appropriate box. So do that, and I want, to, I want you to fill this out. Don't, don't not do the work. Don't not do the flip of the coin. For all four children, you have two minutes. Let's go. OK, are we all set? Have we finished this work? So first of all, what happened in this classroom right now? It's a buzz. It's a mess. It's happening. This is where learning is happening. I want to point this out. Now, for those of you that thought that the probability that the next three children would not have the disease, if the first one did, let's first find out how many here had the first child, raise a hand, how many had the first child have little d, little d? Uh, I need to count them. Keep your hands up. One, two, three, four. What? I'm counting. We really needed a couple hundred people to be statistically valid, so I'm going to multiply each team by four. So the first team was 16. OK. How many in the second child had dd? Wow, the small d's, small d's, small d's, one, two. We'll make that eight. The third child, little d, one, two, three, four, five, six. Well, there's going to go this experiment. The fourth child, little d, one, four. So we have a total of 28. We have a total of 35 responses. I expected this to be about 25%. But of this, we, wait, how many people in the room? Let's call it 100 <laughs> out of 35. So it's a 0.35 probability of a child having this, right? Which is, we're a little undersampled here, but it's only a 25. It's a very small fraction of the number. And you just did this little science experiment. Imagine that you were able to do this in every classroom, that the classroom was flipped, that you were able to come in. You were able to hear from the world-class scholar. And now you're able to go on. So how do you think the students like this? The students much preferred this. They didn't want to go back to any other way. Now, I'm just going to take you video engagement. Who here likes to watch TV? <laughs> Pretty simple. It's the golden age of TV. I'm just going to take you through some more fascinating experiments here, OK? Um, the pro OK. So if you're a film critic, do you like drama? Do you like other ways? But if you're a professor, 
we really want to understand what happens in that classroom. We really want to understand using the data to tell us what's more engaging. PowerPoint slides or if you're teaching slides and code or do you want the talking head and slides and code. And so we actually took millions of data points and we looked at it and here's what we found. Okay, so if you look at how much time here people spent and if you look at the green, people spent much more time, about six to nine minutes <coughs> engaged. But you notice a, a very large drop off right here if there's not a talking head. People are social. The data told us this. Now, let's look at something else the data told us. So we started to look at what was the best way to do this. Was it follow the dancing hand? Have anybody remember that or use console videos? Just pure PowerPoint or just talking head? It turned out that what we found was people, even the certificate earners, dropped off after six to nine minutes. In other words, the highest correlation was your attention span. And even successful learners dropped out. So we've used the data to really look at learner behavior and video length. And it really impacts the percentage of the video viewed. So you really, if you're designing these courses, we know a lot about that. What do we know about demographic behaviors? OK, and so. There's a hypothesis on female performance that they tend to be perfectionist and higher scores, but move less through the curriculum. And if you see some of the, uh, the, some of the very influential TED Talks, you'll see girls who code that perhaps that there is that anecdotal evidence. So we took a look at some of our courses. Okay, and you can see the score here by age and gender and in the average passing. And you notice this part of the curve. Uh, we looked at very successful and mildly successful. So these are all kinds. People have completed four courses in our curriculum or completed 10 courses. And what you see here is pretty interesting. Look at the difference between the female here that are under 35 and the, and the males here we found that that is really true in the data. And it really stayed constant under 35 and over 35. Now, we also were able to look at, and this is content, how you do the content, okay? So you, you know, if you're uh, my contemporary up here, what am I doing? I'm watching a video and doing an assessment, watching a video, doing an assessment, watching a video, doing an assessment. Well, what do millennials uh, and Gen X do? You can almost see these are, these are box plots, uh, and so these little whiskers are what they're doing here. You know, extends how much range you're spending on that time. And so what's really happening is that the students are going and racing to the problems. They're clustering around those problems and then going back to the video. So they really want to try the problems first. A very different learning strategy might be an excellent learning strategy. They want to know how, that's, how they're going to have to listen to that video and what problem they want to solve. Fascinating. Now, what is the dream of personalized learning? What, what was, <laughs> you're all laughing up there, right? You've probably seen this. Um, the dream, perhaps the science foundation dream is advanced personalized learning. So this has been around for a while. Microsoft and 
Harvard collaborated on an open source initiative. What is that adaptive learning? Here, the learner takes a pre-assessment. We want to know not what they achieved with their grade, but what was their knowledge level to start. And then at the end, we ask them to take a final assessment so we can gauge how much they've learned. And from here to here, we want to know what their mastery is. What's the adaptive learning? It refines the model of what the learner knows. And so the systems always, the adaptive engine is choosing the assessments to gauge the mastery. And so what we think is adaptive learning can transform the efficiency of learning by, we have some hypotheses. There are no metadata studies on this, just the way there are metadata studies on, does back surgery work for you? Should you have your meniscus removed? There's many, many meta studies. This one, we don't have a meta study on. So what's the decreased time to mastery? Persistence and grit. Who here knows what grit is? Grit is when you fail, you keep going. And it's a very important theory in psychology. And it's all, this is one of the motivations behind Microsoft's growth mindset. Dweck's work on this is absolutely extraordinary. So what do we, what do we really find? We found, um, and I'm gonna show you how to read this very, very quickly. But what we found was we could actually by instrumenting each question, each assessment type, we could look at an individual learner and we could look at groups of learners. And so this is no adaptivity. This is just what happens. And let me show you how to read this, okay? On the left side here and over here is what we think the system says is the probability that you have mastery. Now you notice all these where we start. So let's take this, uh, this red line. We don't think you have very ma much mastery. And then you do a problem uh, on this module, and you do another one. You get it right. So look, our estimate's up here. And then you take another one, and you fail, you fail, you fail, you fail. What happened there? The student was guessing. And then they finally did another few problems and learned more. So we're looking under the covers and we're able to estimate. Now, we talk about AI and machine learning as having biases. We have no idea where these students started, right? We haven't gauged them yet, and so this is embedded in the algorithm. This is one of the dangers that we have to understand in our complexity. So we have then said, let's cluster the students into groups. And so what you kind of expect is the students would go down in the lower mastery group, and in the higher mastery group, they'd go up. And what you see here is once they pass the course, they don't do as much. But here's the interesting thing about the lower mastery group. See this line? Some people just quit. We don't understand the behavior. Maybe they weren't challenged enough. So, uh, so what does the adaptive engine do? So this is very early. It's some of the very early results. We don't know if this holds. But in scientific transparency, we'll show you a little bit here. So you notice the learning curve here, right? And this is a learning curve that says, over time, what's the number of problems? And what do we think your probability of mastery is? So if you're starting out over here, uh, or down here, or here, and you look at the two groups, um, you have uh, the first group, uh, group A is blue. Group B is gold, and group C is green. If this was a clinical trial for medicine, right, which group would you want to be in? Would you want to early on accelerate and over time know you were going to get improved? You want it nice and smooth. We don't know if this will hold up, but we looked at each of the modules in there, and we don't even know if we look at an individual right now. Notice this, so I'll now give the secret away. The blue group, we are optimizing for mastery. So you see how smooth that is? The yellow group, we're optimizing for continuity. You've heard of move that child onto the next module, can't, can't go back. So 
we just ran an experiment to look at it, and we'll report on this as it comes, but I'll give you an early glimpse here at the National Academy of Science. And right here, you can see that those curves look like you might expect them to, that you have it. So I'm going to wrap up right here. We're on what's called the innovation curve right now. You've all, have you all heard of the tipping point? That's when you cross over time from early adopters to a majority, and then you cross the chasm. But we know that substitution follows the S-curve pattern, and it's already passing that pattern. That is that right now 50% of students are taking at least one online course. So I showed you the hybrid model, which is the teacher in the classroom and the online models. And we know that sometimes there's a hybrid model, right? We know that the Prius is just on the way prior to the Tesla. We have to ask ourselves, is this complex system going to be going to stay as a hybrid model, or are there more complex approaches and will it remain disruptive? We don't know. But I want to tell you this right now. Um, we're in an age of intelligent systems, large data, complex, with high complexity. Education is really a complex adaptive social system, and this is going to require academia and industry to rethink the boundaries of educational research within the broader ecosystem of STEM education. And that's critical to Boeing, that's critical to Microsoft, that's critical to society. And it's also contemporaneous with Lincoln and the founders of this academy who decided that advocacy was an important role of this institution. So I hope today I've framed the problems for you. You've had some fun, and I'll take a few questions. Thank you. <laughs>